I'm watching film of these guys, and I'm I'm noticing Peyton and Russ not being screened, hit by screen. I said, yes, that that's what U of L players do. That's who we are a, a, as guards. Louisville play <laughs> Louisville guards don't get hit by screen. We're relentless, get fighting over. Starting 502 podcast, Presley Meyer, Jake Hook, brought to you by Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon, and we are here for the first time in the Kearns Corner Studios. We could not be more excited uh, to finally start bringing you guys live content where they're gonna, there's going to be a bunch of people in the same place in person. That's how we started out doing this thing a long time ago. We're trying to get back to that. Uh, and with the grace of my wonderful wife, we're trying to make it happen. Uh, so, uh, Jake, how are you, sir? I'm good. Moved into a house, got a puppy. I don't know where she's at, but uh, I'm what? good doing adult things, but not nearly as many adult things as you're doing. <laughs> what kind of puppy did you get? Uh, she's an, uh, She's asleep right now. Uh, she's an Australian Shepherd and a Doodle. Um, yeah, my, my fiance can get her here really quickly. I'll, the, I'll show her to you. She's cute for sure, but she, she just loves to piss in the house. The first thing that you said was Australian shepherd. And the fact that you mentioned Australian shepherd and acted like, oh my gosh, look at that baby. Hello. <laughs> What's her name? Daisy. Daisy. So the mm -hmm. fact that you said Australian shepherd and then you, you said she's asleep is like shocking to me because you know we have an Australian Shepherd puppy mm -hmm. and she's six months old and like she could go for six straight hours running and barking and playing and jumping on everybody and she would not even look tired in the least like it, it's I've never had a dog like this where it's like there's nothing that we could do to entertain her and then you put her in her crate and she cries just non the crate just... yes she hates the crate but she is so lazy like she naps with us she sleeps in our bed with us very chill and like when it's been hot like 90 95 degrees outside we'll take her outside to use the bathroom and she literally won't she just wants to go back in or she wants to go in <laughs> shade or she wants to go in water like if it's too hot she just wants to go lay down so uh she hasn't been too bad at all for those who follow along with with our dogs on social media you probably know this, but it sounds like your dog, Jake, is a combination of Jack and Lulu, which are my two dogs. So Lulu's an, an Australian Shepherd, and we think she's a mini because she's a little over six months old now, and she's really not, you know, she doesn't, she's not even approaching typical Australian Shepherd size, <laughs> uh, but she is crazy hyper. And then Jack, he can, he can have his moments, but he's a golden Jack. So he's a golden retriever Jack Russell mix. So he has that Jack Russell yeah. in him, but he also has that goofy, like lazy golden retriever attitude. Um, mm -hmm. And he just loves to just lounge around and you could just leave him. You could, if I stayed in bed until 2 PM, not saying that I ever do this, but if I were to stay in there, you know, and not get up to go pee or, uh, you know, get food or anything like that, he would just lay there on his back sleeping all day. He just, dude just couldn't, he couldn't have a care in the world. Which is great. Yeah, so she, yeah, I she think I think you got the best of both. Like nine thirty. He goes to bed yeah, nine thirty. Bed with us at nine thirty, and then she'll stay in bed until nine ten a.m. Like on a weekend, she'll stay in bed mm -hmm. till nine ten a.m. Whenever we do, and she, as long as she doesn't pee anywhere, then she's been an angel. But she just yeah. she's got the bladder of a of that's a baby the worst. that drank a Mountain Dew. <laughs> that's the worst part about puppies, man. Uh, and for anybody listening, you could probably relate. It's just like. Until they have that first heat, it's like they cannot control that pee. Mm -hmm. That excited pee is unbelievable. Like if I came over there right now, she'd just be just making little little dribbles everywhere. Gotta love it. Yeah, Don't get a puppy. Most of our ready. house is hardwood, so yeah, yeah. That's that's the key, right? Yeah, we oh. we keep them on the hardwood, um, and life is good. Hey, that yeah, yeah, you got married by the way. Yeah, I got married. Got the rock. Married and in, in a new house, all in thirty days. So, and had the wedding at our house. So I don't know what the hell we were thinking, but I got a lot of good bourbon out of it. And speaking of bourbon, um, Mr. and Mrs. So I have this special edition Mr. and Mrs. White Label from Mr. and Mrs. Lane um, that so kind of, kindly gifted me 
a Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon white label that says Mr. and Mrs. Meyer on it with our um, wedding date on it as well. Uh, one of many exciting bottles that we got, but I had to crack open first and foremost the Mr. and Mrs. White Label. The one thing that Mr. and Mrs. wants you to know, if you did not listen to our last podcast, go and do so. Because Russ imparts so much wisdom about, about TBT, about his playing career, about what it's like to get into the bourbon industry. Uh, we talked about all of that stuff. Um, but most importantly, the thing that he wants you to know about his endeavors in the bourbon industry is just the fact that these aren't collector's items. Like, even if you go out and get the Ville TBT bottles, which we'll talk about here in a second, this isn't something to collect. It's not something that that you want to have dust on it. It's not something that you want somebody to pick up and be like, oh, no way, you got a Russ Smith bottle? Like, we want this to be like, uh, you know, or they want this to be specifically the, the next big thing, right? Like, this is, you know, they're they're trying to make their way into a, a, a very competitive industry, and Russ is not going to be able to make it if you guys are all just buying up his bottles and then not drinking them. Because that means that you're not going to get more. Uh, and and this is stuff that's not good enough to be saved. It is meant to be drank. Um, and if you give it a shot, if you go out to any local establishment at this point, they're going to have it. If you live in Louisville and you go to a bar that that has bourbon, they're going to have some form of Mr. and Mrs. Um, the white label is one of my favorites. I like the regular blue label as well. Uh, the rye is fantastic. And on the podcast, we were uh, the first ever to open the the Ville bottles and the TBT bottles. Uh, and I got to say, I think the the Ville bottle is the best Mr. and Mrs. that I've tried. It's a good combination of like kind of the like floral notes that you get from the white label uh, and kind of the sweetness and like the. Uh, like the caramel type type of flavors that you get from, um, you know, the the traditional just blue label bottle as well. Um, no, M- Mr. and Mrs. is fantastic. And if you haven't gotten a chance to go out and grab yourself a TBT bottle or a The Ville bottle, which there are a limited amount of these, um, you still have opportunities left. So uh, your next opportunity is going to be July 12th from 5.30 to 7.30 Central Time at Liquor Barn in Owensboro. If you know, don't know where Owensboro is, it is, if you just go west, what, an hour and a half, I think, from Louisville, you can hit Owensboro right there on the river. Uh, Liquor Barn in o- Owensboro, 5.30 to 7.30 Central Time. Uh, so that would make it 6.30 to 8.30 Eastern Time. Um, if that doesn't work for you, if you're local in Louisville, July 13th, so the next day, July 13th, they will be at Kroger, Again, that's the Kroger Wine and Spirit Shop on Breckenridge Lane from 3.30 to 5.30 Eastern. So again, Kroger on Breckenridge Lane, July 13th, 3.30 to 5.30. July 15th, they will be at the Liquor Barn in Middletown, a massive Liquor Barn location um, if you've never been out that way, 5.30 to 7.30, July 15th. And then finally, Liquor Barn on Outer Loop on July 16th from 5.30 to 7.30. Again, the TBT bottles, the the Ville bottles, those will be exclusively released at those locations. There is a limited number. Uh, so if you're trying to get out there and you want to get in on the action, you want to get a chance to see Russ, you want to get a chance to, uh, you know, be a part of that experience, and you want a chance to enjoy some really damn good bourbon, uh, make sure you make your way out to those. We will post that on our social as well. Um, but yeah, Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon, it's... Uh, you know, the more that we learn about their story and learn about their plans for the future and learn about exactly what it what it is that's gone into this bourbon, the labor of love uh, of Russ and Sean, uh, who is who helps facilitate everything for him and Cece, uh, the co-founder, and Mr. and Mrs. as well. Um, it's a really exciting time um, for Russ and for this brand. Uh, so we're excited to be a part of it, man. We really are. Um Jake, getting in very quickly to our guest, our guest this week. Um, I thought it was, uh, I'm hoping it turns out okay. We got off to a rocky start because he was in uh, a bad cell, you know, had some bad cell coverage. Uh, but, you know, we stuck the landing uh, with Reese Gaines, who is, um, you know, if you're ranking top 10, top 15 global basketball players of all time, I think it has to include Reese, uh, former NBA lottery pick. Played two years with Denny, two years with Rick Pitino, 
Uh, everybody remembers him for some of those games against, you know, Cincinnati, Marquette. Uh, obviously, the infamous game where he hit two of the three shots in, in like 25 seconds against Tennessee. Um, Jake, anything that you took away from this interview that you want people to, to uh, you know, remember? I mean, just incredibly rare perspective for any human to have, particularly with a Louisville interest. I mean, played under Denny, played under Rick, went to the NBA, coached at Louisville and is now coaching this TBT team. So, I mean, any question or part of your fandom that you're interested in, he can give you an answer to, which I think is extremely rare to find in anybody. Yeah. Yeah. So Reese kind of, like you said, he kind of has that um, unique experience of playing for Denny, which I think Louisville fans, they don't try to separate themselves into Denny versus Rick versus Peck Hickman versus Chris Mack, like whatever, you know, but there are a lot of people who are, you know, like Denny Crumb, like OG Denny Crumb truthers, right? Um, and he saw the end of the Denny era, which, you know, he went out pretty gracefully, but overall it wasn't like a huge, uh, how, how do I put this? You know, they, they didn't, when, when he finished his, his coaching career, and when Reese was getting his start at U of L, U of L was just okay in those days. And so there's a unique perspective of somebody that went from the end of the Denny era to the Rick Bettino era, which was, you know, the pomp and circumstances that surrounded him and Tom Jurich, you know, uh, escorting him off the plane and, and walking through the airport and, you know, pulling him out of, out of uh, the NBA waters. Um, you know, everything that went along with that. And then Rick coming to Louisville and them, you know, they weren't immediately like some crazy success, but immediately Rick got there and they were pretty damn good. Uh, they were, you know, a force to be reckoned with in Conference USA. You know, they had some quality wins. I believe in Rick's first year, they had that crazy comeback win against Tennessee that we just mentioned. They had a win over like number two or number three Cincinnati. Um, so Rick was already doing Rick things back then. Uh, and then the year after Reese left, obviously uh, Louisville, or a year or two years after Reese left, Louisville uh, actually went to the fir their first Final Four uh, since, what was it, 86? Had it been that long? 86 to 2005? Was that was, was it that long of a gap? I think it might have been. I think so. I think you're right. Either way, uh, a very unique perspective because then after – his playing career. So he was an NBA lottery pick, which again provides a unique perspective on what it takes uh, to, to make it at the highest level. Um, we talked about the fact that, that Dwayne Wade once called Reese Gaines, the most, you know, the toughest person he's ever had to defend or the best player that he's ever played against when he was in the NBA. So I thought that was fascinating as well. Uh, and then kind of get into uh, the fact that Reese, you know, he was uh, a, an assistant coach for Bellarmine. Uh, and then he was, um, uh, I believe he was the coach in waiting at Bellarmine, if I if, if I remember correctly. Uh, and then went to the San Antonio Spurs program for a little bit and actually took over as, as the acting head coach for a little bit at, with the San Antonio Spurs, made his way back, was a part of the Chris Mack staff. Uh, was a part of the the Kenny Payne staff, so really a, a, a truly unique perspective and somebody who is really hungry to to be successful in the future. Uh, any uh, fast facts on on Louisville Final Fours? Yeah, you were right. It was it was 86, 86 to two thousand five. Eighty six to two thousand and five. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. Crazy world, lots of smells. Um, <laughs> e either way, though, um, we hope you guys enjoy this interview. Very soon we'll be got kind of diving into TBT, what that means, um, you know, what the roster looks like. We don't want to get into it too much, but it sounds like there is one more player waiting to join the roster, and it's one that fans will be very, very excited about. Uh, has local ties as well, so, you know, if that kind of clues you in a little bit. Um, but without further ado, drink Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon, Reese Gaines. We are... Uh, excited and humbled to welcome our next guest to the show. Uh, one of the greatest players, and I will always uh, be adamant about this, one of the more underappreciated players uh, in Louisville basketball history, uh, Reese Gaines. Reese, 
you're out on the road right now. Uh, what's going on with your life and, and, and how are you? I'm doing good. I'm just uh, right now, you know, spend some time with, with, with my, with my boys, and you know, getting a chance to get them in the gym for the first time. So that, that's been fun. You always stood out to me as um, Dwayne Wade's favorite player. I don't how many times is that brought up to you uh, a, a week? The fact that he listed you as this, or as as the most the most difficult player he's faced in his career. I think we might have lost. The more appreciative you, you get, it. I think it's a big deal. I mean, he was yeah. a great player, and and to be used as a as a measuring stick and for somebody that great is, um, I'm, you use the word underappreciated, and that that's. With the rest of the, you know, the, the really good players that that played at uh, U I mean, I had a, a chance to be in a unique spot, um, kind of the resurgence, kind of the same spot we're in again right now, where I got a chance to stand out, kind of help put the Louisville brand back on the map, and that can't be taken away from me, no matter if you remember it or not. That happened, but I got a chance to kind of bring the bring the brand back and and be a part of an exciting time, you know. So I I definitely appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, you talked about putting the brand back on the map, right? Uh, and, and you know. It was obviously a huge brand under Coach Crum. Uh, talk just a little bit about, you know, you're from Wisconsin. That's not an area that's like, you know, been a hotbed for Louisville um, to, to acquire players. Obviously, Jerry Smith is another name that comes to mind. But for the most part, uh, you know, not like a, a huge area that's produced players that, to come to Louisville. Talk about your relationship with Coach Crum uh, and, and how you ended up at U of L. U of L was a big brand, but it wasn't necessarily a national brand at, at that time. I, I didn't really know U of L the history at all, but my father and my mother did. And when they met Coach Crum, he, he seemed genuine and sincere, and they trusted him and uh, as a human being. And I kind of just just listened to them, you know, for one of the rare times in my life. I listened to my parents, and and it worked out obviously. I'm sure when you started your career, right, you never could have anticipated that that's how it would have ended, right? I mean, you start off with a legendary coach like Coach Crum, and all of a sudden, you know, I think a year or two years in, all of a sudden it's it's Rick Pitino, which at the time yeah. when Coach Pitino came in to you, was that like a huge household name? Were you super familiar with his, his body of, of work? Of course. It was a big deal. School did too. Perfect coach for the school at the time. He was coming back. He was hungry. He's coming from the NBA. So he automatically had everyone's respect but he was also known for developing players and getting players there and letting players play the, you know, and, and maximizing everyone's talent and putting them in spaces to perform at a high level. And that's what he did for me. Yeah. And Reese, what was the biggest transition from from to Patino? You're used to him for two years and a new coach comes in. What's the biggest thing you are like, okay, wow. He does this differently. Man, let me, let me be careful. So uh, I would say this. Patino came at a time when player development was just coming in. So, you know, in terms of nationally, right? So we did a lot more individual instructions, which was huge. Him coming back from the NBA, he understood where to put players and make the most successful. And he, and, he, and the, the offense was was a little bit more wide open for me. And, and he just brought a lot of energy, um, a, lot, a lot of life back in, in – into my basketball life, obviously. And um, not to say that I learned a lot from Coach Crum, too. It was just different. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot about overall basketball fundamentals from Coach Crum. But when Coach Tino came, it was definitely more player-specific. How can I make you better? How can I, you know, how can I get you get you to your peak uh, performance consistently? And he was, he was very challenging mentally, physically, pushed you to the limit. He just made you believe you're, you're, you can overcome anything. You're built and ready and prepared for anything. And that's and once it took that belief, it, it kind of it kind of propels you, you know, when you're on the floor playing. Gotcha. And I was gonna say you were what I think I was looking at it 29 and five in your first two years at Freedom Hall. Just like insane home record, especially compared to the road record. How excited are you to bring that back to Freedom Hall this year with TBT and then see it at the yum here in a few years, or hopefully this year with the home crowd, with a bigger attendance and hopefully a home court advantage. Man, I, I'm kind of embarrassed. I've been asked that question. And the answers that I have, my pre-coach answers, don't do it justice with how I really feel the closer and closer we get to going back to, like I said before earlier today, I mean, it's a special place, even beyond special. I call it, you know, sacred, holy. It's a place 
where I've learned many life lessons. To go back there and, and, and have a chance to reconnect with the fans, to reconnect with the city and Louisville basketball, especially since the, the past two years for me, it's what everyone says. There are no words, and I, I really sincerely mean that from the bottom of my heart. There, there really isn't. I'm, I'm so excited to be a part of, to be a part of U of L basketball again, and, and, and the, to be in that arena, you know, what I mean, uh, it's, it's going to be special. Kind of getting into, you know, TBT. Obviously, this is what, you know, uh, this is this is what's kind of brought back a lot of this nostalgia, right? Um, but you've been back in in Louisville for, you know, it's been o- over a decade, pretty much, right? I mean, you came back to Bellarmine in 2012, right? 2011. Yeah, yeah I've been based in Louisville. I've, I've been. I went to Eastern Kentucky. Right. I went back to Texas for a while and uh, with the Spurs, and I came right back. Came right back home. Yep. Yeah. So, so, so what? What was it? What, was it just that experience uh, with the fans, with the program, with the city? Uh, what was it that kind of drew you back? Uh, you know, was it just the opportunities that presented themselves, or was it kind of a, a whole combination of that? I mean, I said it earlier today. It's like I said, being around now the best, the best fan base in college basketball and I, and I would and, and I would say it's um it's because of the passion the knowledge of the game um and and their criticism is 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 like family you know what I mean it's it's so that's how I always feel here you always feel home you always feel like family you always feel like you know um um beyond welcome but I I just appreciated that type of love and that type of atmosphere so much and it shaped my life. You know what I mean? I, like I said earlier, I, I, you know, any time in life you go through ups and downs and the lessons I learned here prepared me for those, got me through those tough times. Playing here isn't easy. It's not for everyone. It's a mentally, it's mentally challenging. It's emotionally challenging, but it's also very rewarding. And um, it, it, it literally prepared me for, for anything in life um, that I, that I, that I faced. And that's why I have so much love and so much appreciation for the fans, for the city, and for University of Louisville. Yeah, you, Luke, Peyton, I've heard a lot of people that we've talked to, you know, explain this. But uh, I think everybody kind of felt like you guys were right there last year uh, talking about, you know, the, the, the TBT team. And it was just kind of almost a fluky, banked-in shot to win for the other team. Um, away from basically going to the Elite Eight, right? They're basically, yeah. you know, advancing to, you know, the really late stages in this tournament. Um, you know, what what is it that you can learn from that? Uh, and, and, and what are you guys taking into this year? Um, and, and is there a chip on your shoulder as well? Like, you know, I, do you I think, think the, guys, the guys have that chip on their shoulder a little bit? I think the answers were in your question, to be honest. <laughs> I, I, I think right. um, the, the loss... You can tell now that the, the guys, it's fun. We're excited, but now they want to win. It, 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 it now would mean something they could tell what it meant to the fans, but what it means to them and for those guys to continue to, to be together and play together as long as we can. And, um, and, and kind of learning from what went wrong at the end of the game. Like I said, Mark did a great job. I'm not changing much. We're not changing much as a staff, as a team. It, it, it was, he, they played well. And now we just got to learn in those situations. Um, who do we go to? How tough we got to play? How physical we got to be? You know, how, how to make sure we, we we take care of situations where, you know, maybe, um, you know, in Europe those are fouls. Late game TBT eliminated. That might not be a foul. So all those small adjustments we got to make as a team, as a staff, in terms of balancing. Like I said before, you know, do we just throw the ball to Trez? Do we run a play to look cute? Which one do we do? How do mm-hmm. we manage that in those late game situations? Is it's something that we have to learn from from the staff and as a team. And I, I think starting already, we started early. Everybody I talk to, each player is like, we want to win. That's the goal. That's the point. I love – it's fun. I like it. But now it's, it's a little more serious than it was last year. If you are, you know, trying to prepare for this tournament, uh, do you do you have to practice differently for that physicality? You know, I, I know that, that in the old Big East, you know, Peyton, Russ – Chris Jones, you know, all these guys are going to be on this team. They thrived on that phys- physicality yeah. and, and and the refs allowing them uh, to maybe get away with a yeah. little bit more. Uh, do, you, do you think that's something you have to practice going into this? Yeah. Yes, I, I think I'd be, be 
you know, these guys are pros that they're used to that physical that physicality a little bit. And 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 we want to make sure we, we come out healthy. But I think you want to practice the physicality technically for the spacing. You want to make mm-hmm. sure the spacing is correct. Guys are knocking up for spots. You want to make sure your fundamentals are right. When you're facing up this time, we can't play with the ball. We got to catch the ball in traffic. So we want to get used to doing those technical fundamental things in that environment, that intense environment consistently, especially late in the game when it gets really, really rough and intense. Yeah, man, I, I, I like, you know, just listening to you, I can tell how much this means to you, how much this means to to the team as a whole. Uh, you know, you guys are out to prove something, you know, and, and, and I think a lot of people see TBT and they just kind of take it really lightly, right? Like they say like, oh, you know, it's guys that are, you know, past their prime or it's guys that, you know, they play, they played in college 10 years ago. I mean, Reese, you know, you were here, you know, that this makes us all feel old. You were here 20 <laughs> yeah. years ago, man. Like, yep. you know, it's, uh, you know, that you guys really take this seriously though. Like, well, I think that that's, I think that's the message we're trying to send about what I say to our fan base in our city. Right. That's just right. who we are as a city, as a fan base. If it's serious basketball being played and our guys are a part of it, then we're going to support it and, and, and give it all we got because that's what we learned from. We learned that from the uh, our, the people watching us, the people we watch go to work and then come and pay tickets for us. We we know we give it all we got no matter what it is if the basketball is involved. And, and honestly, to be honest, there's a lot of high-level basketball players playing in this tournament as well, too, to keep it to, to keep it out you know, to, to right. be truthful. So there's a lot of guys making a lot of money on on our team playing overseas who don't necessarily right. need to play. Right. But they want right. to do it for the right reason. So I'm excited about that. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's the message. Uh, you know, if you're selling this to a fan to to come out to Freedom Hall to check out these games, or even if you know, if they if they don't have the means or the time or whatever to watch on TV, you know. I think that's the pitch, right? That's the pitch is that you guys are are, are doing this the right way and you're, you're coming for the right reasons. Uh, I think that's that's a massive part of this, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we're 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 showing everyone what's different about us. Everyone else to everyone else. Basketball is, is, is you know, not as sacred. You know, it's, it's not it's not as serious. So that's all right. Our guys are playing in something that's important. We're going to support them. We're going to back them. We're going to show you. We're going to show you guys aren't like who we are right now. The difference between you and us, and, and that's part of it. We're, we're part of it. We kind of want to get the ball rolling with, with with three nice wins at home, and it's going to be challenging. But we're looking forward to it. Yeah, and and again, that's the thing, right? If enough people show up, it could be four nice wins in, in, in a row at home. I mean, that's such a huge thing. Uh, you know, UK is, but and, and again, we don't want to put the cart before the horse, right? Yes. But uh, you know, that a lot of people are seeing that, that down the line. You know, I think that's a, you know, as a, as a pitch to fans, that's like, sure. you know, home court advantage. How much does that mean to you guys? For sure. I, I mean, when, when you, when you talk about tradition, I mean, there are going to be people watching this and saying, yeah, that they sold out a TBT. Wow. Mm-hmm. And that, and that's what I, I I want out of this for, for the university, for everyone, for city involved and show them who, who we really are and kind of kick, kickstart the year before football, before basketball gets going, baseball, all the sports. Look, Summertime, this we, we got it going. We got that. I think Coach Kelsey says revival, whatever's going on right now. We want to be a part of that as well. Yeah, uh, and you you mentioned Coach Kelsey. Um, you know, I, I think as as someone from the outside, we're hoping right that these that that the players get to experience this firsthand before the season even starts. Right, Coach Kelsey's brought in thirteen new players that have never experienced what it's like to play in front of a Louisville crowd. Uh, going back to to last year, you know, you were around those guys last year. Uh, you know, did, did did they take anything away from TBT as far as like, you know, were were you guys pointing to TBT? I would, I would saying, say this. What? Yeah, a, a little a little bit, and I, I think to say this for this year. Um, I, I said it. I said it earlier to radio. Um, when I was getting ready to watch film, I'm watching film of these guys. I'm I'm noticing Peyton and Russ not being screened. Hit by screen. I said yes. That that's what U of L players do. That's who we are a, a, as guards. Louisville play back. Louisville guards don't get hit by screen. We're relentless, get fighting over it. Right. And those are the kind of things I want the, the the new players to see. This is what what Louisville players. This is how they play. All right. The bigs. I mean. I mean. Shane was relentless. I mean. He was. He was mm-hmm. unbelievable. 
He was getting rebounds outside of his area, blocking shots outside of his area. Always, always wanted contact and being physical. And he and he ran the floor. So those those are kind of things I want to you know I want the, the new guys to see. This is Louisville basketball. One thing that team did great, but I want everyone to see what is they played great together, and they were and they love sharing the ball with each other, and they play as a team, and it was a beautiful thing to watch. Before we get you out of here, I gotta ask any good you know always have to ask any former Louisville pl- or Coach Patino player, you know any good Coach P stories. I know you said. Your goal was to put other people on the treadmill, right? Like you weren't trying yeah. to get on the treadmill. But, you know, any any good uh, Coach P stories that you like to impart upon people? Man, it, all the good ones I don't want to say publicly. <laughs> I, 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 man, <laughs> though, but those are the best ones. Um, I, I, I guess the same with everyone's heard about the Ellis Miles story. I was in that workout. Ellis, was he was working pretty hard. He thought mm-hmm. it was hard at the time. It wasn't Patino hard. So, you know, he's messing around. Coach goes, look, if you do that move, move again, I'm going to see you in the first flight to Compton. <laughs> and I don't think Ellis has ever heard anything like that before. And from that point on, he was he was, he was was changed. He was the first one on the treadmill willingly. And that, that kind of set the tone for me for, for the rest of that season, how serious this was and how, and how to approach anything that we're doing on the basketball floor. Yeah, I mean, you talk about setting the tone. That's what we're trying to do, you know, the, the, in the coming month uh, with TBT, man. Uh, Reese, yeah. we are, uh, uh, you know, honored and humbled that, that you uh, gave us a little bit of your time. Man, uh, thank you for having me. I really some, appreciate it. Yeah, go enjoy some stogies with your boys. <laughs> uh, go, go go hang out and, 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 and enjoy some peace and quiet before the hecticness uh, of TBT. Uh, we appreciate your time, and, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, thank you. Oh, thanks, brother.